some of the parks, including Shashue, have remote bush camps. So if you want, you can take a multi-day hike from one bush camp to another, and they're not accessible by, by vehicle. So um, if you really want to get close to nature and wow. not have any of the, the distractions of modern technology, that's really the best way to do it. And okay. there's nothing in the world like waking up at five in the morning and seeing the sun rise over the pristine African wilderness. It is, it's amazing. Welcome to the A Midlife Traveler podcast, where we want you to go see the world, discover interesting stories about people, places, and practical advice to help you plan your next vacation. Hey, let's go see the world. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the Everywhere Travel Podcast. My name is Laura, I'm your host, and today we have a story for anyone anyone out there who is interested in visiting Africa, South Africa, doing any type of safari, because we have an expert here, Nick Bratton, who you would have met in the last episode. Nick is an American, but he grew up in Africa, and he also spent a year as a river rafting guide. He's done many activities throughout the continent, visited lots of countries, and done lots of different types of adventuring and safaris. So for me... I was thrilled to meet Nick because two years ago, I had decided really that I wanted to plan out a bucket list Africa trip. And so I did a lot of research and, you know, figured out what countries I wanted to visit and kind of put together some key sites and areas from uh, South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe. And I was also pretty curious about Kenya, but I never did that trip. I did a lot of research a couple years ago, but I never did that trip. Instead, we ended up in Thailand, in Vietnam, which might be a story from a different podcast. But today we're talking about Africa. And so when I met Nick and I said, you know, a couple of years ago, I had planned this bucket list trip. Can I just talk to you about it? So you are going to hear me from memory trying to recount the, the things I wanted to see in different points of Africa and getting advice from Nick all along the way. And we talk about dune surfing in the Namib desert. We talk about salt pans, penguins, hippopotamus in the Okavanga Delta. We talk about a little bit of river rafting, big game parks, and a bit about the coastline areas of South Africa and also over into Kenya and some of the different types of safaris people can take. Nick is a tremendous wealth of knowledge. So For anyone who has Africa on your bucket list, like I do, I hope you get a lot of good ideas out of this. And please know that if you visit our midlifetraveler.com podcast, we will not only have show notes for this episode, but we'll also put a curated list of some great ideas of vacation packages in Africa and then other like day tours and things to do around Africa. So with that, here's Africa. Can I tell you my, my bucket list thing that yeah, I had mapped? I'd love mapped? to hear it, yeah. Okay, because I was trying to figure out a way that I could do South Africa and see a whole bunch of stuff in two weeks. Mm-hmm. So this was my plan. The first thing is I have this strange bucket list that I insist in some time in my lifetime I need to see a penguin in its natural habitat. Oh, yeah. So, so you want to go to Boulder's Beach? Yes, yes. Off of So I, if you go to Seattle to Cape Town, there's Boulder's Beach. Mm-hmm. It looked amazing. And then I don't really know what else in Cape Town was that interesting to me. It just there's, I'm sure there's interesting things. I wanted to see the penguins, and then get up to Namibia mm-hmm. and go up into the desert, of course. And I think is it Swakopmund? Swakopmund, yeah. Swakopmund. Mm-hmm. And there's something called the Skeleton Coast. Yeah. And don't they only have so many permits that go in? Uh, I don't know what the access is, but um, there what's what is a really cool way to see it, and might, if you have the time, might be one option for you, is driving from, um, uh, you can drive to Valthus Bay from basically the, the southern end of Namibia, and you basically drive up through the desert along the dunes on the coast. So as an American, which I am, and I do not know anything about African culture or customs or speak anything remotely resembling the language, is that safe for me? Like, would oh, you absolutely. Incur- 
Really? Absolutely. It seems very, yeah. very intimidating for me because I've seen these where you drive yourself safari or you get a guide, but it seems very, even though I've been all across different places in Asia and South America and Europe, and Africa intimidates me. Well, like you something can, how I feel like I'm going to be in danger um, if I drive myself. I don't think so. I mean, if you go with a group of people who are with you, then you can totally do the self-drive option. I mean, driving in the Namib Desert is, if you've never driven on sand in a 4x4, then maybe go with a guided group. But there's a whole range of options. Um, but this, the, the Namib Desert is just spectacular. So it's it's the red sand, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's two there's things about it. So there's that that skeleton coast, which mm-hmm. I understand is like one of the only places in Africa where the ocean touches the desert. Mm-hmm. And it's the oldest desert in the world, I think. Is it really? Yeah. Don't quote me, but yeah, I, close I, I think I I'll think go- Google that later. Um, but there's also a salt pan, right? There's like the it begins with an M. Magadi Gadi. Yes. Yeah. That just looks. I don't know what it looks like, but it just looks really crazy cool and in stark contrast to the red sand of the desert. Mm-hmm. Have you been through there? Um, no, I haven't been that far north, but uh, did go through the uh, the Namib Desert to the kind of the Dune Sea. Dune 45 is kind of the main attraction there um, that you, you see a lot of pictures of. Um, and then I also hiked the Fish River Canyon, um, which is a seasonal thing, and that's also the access is very tightly restricted there as well. They only allow so many people in at once, and that's the second biggest canyon in the world, and that was like a three or four day hike. Wow! So do people really uh, surf down the dunes? I've seen mm-hmm. like these dune surfing yeah. companies. That's a real thing. It's pretty wild. Yeah, the pictures look pretty cool. Yeah. So if you're surfing like that, and you're doing dune, dune surfing, you're making enough noise that you scare the snakes. Yeah, you told the, me earlier. The snakes will be long gone by the time you, okay. you come so zooming down the dune. Okay, so I can safely dune surf then. Yeah. Okay, that'd be good. That's on my list then. Salt pans, skeleton coves, dune surfing. So then from Namibia going up north, and I don't know where they. I think there there are a couple game reserves. Yeah, in Namibia. Atosha is, is that, a big one. Up yes, north? that's yeah. it. Atosha National Park. So I was going to do that over to um, Botswana. Mm-hmm. Is that what touches? Yeah, Botswana will be to the east. Yeah. Yeah. Is Botswana where they have the the marsh, the water? The Okavango Delta. Okavango yes. Delta. That's it. Yeah. That place is fantastic. You can take a like a really small plane, like a four seater Cessna, and just fly into a little island in the delta, and they'll have the campsite set up there, and then you can kind of cruise around in these dugout canoes called Makoros. And you know, one of the, the guides will will pull, you know, has a pole and will push these things around. And the water is not very deep; it's like three or four feet deep. And uh, you just go through these like seas of reeds and 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 lily pads, and it's the bird life is just amazing. Are there dangerous animals? Do you see like crocodiles or alligators or hippopotamus or anything? Uh, there are some of those things in certain places, but the guides know, you know, where where to go, where safe, and where to avoid. So they, I think they do camping out there, too. Yeah, sometimes. you can camp you on can these camp. little islands, yeah. What kind of critters show up when you camp out on the Okavanga Delta? And nothing to worry about. <laughs> you're totally, <laughs> you, you're catching my vibe. I want to be, I really want to go see this, but I, I'm not a big fan of, like, snakes and small no, you, critters you, in my you, tent. You zip up your tent, and it's fine. Okay, zip up the tent. That's good. And then from that, I can't remember what my next step was that I had, that I planned. Maybe it was uh, just Victoria falls mm-hmm. because you feel like you got to see it yeah i've heard it's pretty cool but it's it, pretty spectacular doesn't it border um it's oh my goodness victoria falls is in it's the border Z- between zambia, zambia and zimbabwe, and zimbabwe. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. have you have you been yeah in fact that was the first place i ever went rafting was is on the really? zambezi river yeah very cool mm-hmm. yeah and that that's that's a rush huge water just breathtaking rapids and uh Tons of excitement. Is that through the park where the animals are? Um, no, it's it's down in the gorge, directly, almost directly below the falls. Okay. So there are, there are no animals there, and you will not see any crocodiles because they do not like class five white water. <laughs> okay, good point, good point, well played. But because there are some really huge game parks right there mm-hmm. that they're promising all sorts of, I think, big five sightings. What is it? Is it Kobe? Chobe? C H O B E? Yeah, Chobe is in Botswana. Um, and that's oh, okay. that's so a great that great place. And the the northern Zimbabwe game parks are um, Wange, um, which is kind of in the northwestern corner of the country. 
And uh, what else is up there? Well, there's the Kariba area, which is pretty amazing as well. So so all the stuff, so we're talking about this bucket list trip that I had sort of mapped out that I was hoping I could do in two weeks um, and someday I'll take. But what if someone didn't have two weeks and they just wanted to go in and have an experience of Africa or South Africa and get a little bit of a safari experience? I mean, there are regions. You've got Cape Town, you've got Johannesburg, you've got Kenya. You've got. Do you have any comparison or impressions or recommendations for someone who maybe flies over from the States and only has one week and they just kind of want to see big sure. game? Um, well, I think a really good entry point for the American tourist who's not looking for the, like the most adventurous off the map experience would be in South Africa. Um, and the reason oh, okay. being is that it it's it's a very highly developed and modern country and a lot of the um, a lot of the 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 aspects of Western civilization that we've come to take for granted here in the United States are present there. Like the road networks are good. Everybody uses a cell phone, uh, you know, grocery stores, cafes, like all the all the Comforts and trappings of so it's easy. Western society so it's easy are there. For Americans to go abroad it's an and have transition. a unique most, experience and a yeah. comfortable. Most people speak basic English. Basic levels, yeah. Um, the the tourism infrastructure there is fantastic, and people are just absolutely wonderful. And um, probably if you had a short period of time, what I would recommend is uh, one of two things: is either flying into Johannesburg and then going to Kruger, which is the biggest park in the country, um, and that can fill more than that can fill weeks i mean it's it, that would be one experience um, you had an alternative safari experience to the cape town south africa and i think it was durban yeah flying to durban which is a major port city on the east coast and from there you can drive about two and a half hours north to a game park called schlussluhe mfolosi repeat that one again so schlussluhe mfolosi and it, it's not spelled the way it sounds um, but it's the oldest game park in South Africa. It was the first one established. Uh, and it's it's not as big as Kruger, but it has the big five. Um, and then uh, it also has some less commonly seen animals like the wild dog. Uh, my wife and I just went there this past November, and we were fortunate enough to see one of the packs of the wild dog. But one of the real highlights, and you can probably do this in other parks as well, but definitely in Shoshlue, is the walking safari. So you, it's just you and a guide and a small group on foot in pristine wilderness through the game park. And your level of awareness and connection to the to nature and to the animals is so much different from the experience that you get in a, in a 4x4. I didn't know that there were walking safaris. All the yeah. ones that I've seen, I've looked at from tour companies, all are typically within vehicles. Mm-hmm. You stay in your vehicle. Yeah. Some of the parks, including Shoshue, have remote bush camps. So if you want, you can take a multi-day hike from one bush camp to another, and they're not accessible by by vehicle. So um, if you really want to get close to nature and wow. not have any of the the distractions of modern technology, that's really the best way to do it. And okay. there's nothing in the world like waking up at five in the morning and seeing the sun rise over the pristine African wilderness. It is it's amazing. Yeah. Probably not many people get to see that. So it's a real very treat. special. It's yeah. a real treat. So what about Kenya? So that's another common thing that I see when I look mm-hmm. at tours and look at places. Um, it seems like, oh, Kenya, and go to the Serengeti. And I have no opinion on that. What is your opinion? Well, it's been a really long time since I've been there. Um, I, I lived there in the, in the mid-'80s. And uh, even then, the, the tourism infrastructure was really well-developed. And some of the major parks, like Masai Mara, were uh, were really heavily crowded. And I have these memories of just like seeing the 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 safari vehicles, all kind of like 20 of them circling around like the one lion, and uh, it felt a little overrun. Um, that was then. Things may have changed now. I don't know how the game park management has evolved over time, um, but there are a lot of pretty spectacular places in Kenya as well. It's a very diverse landscape because you have um, the desert in the north and you have kind of this equatorial rainforest there are highlands there are lakes um beautiful coast you've got lake victoria in the west there's so much to see there uh, that's a good point so you know people think of africa and they think of oh let's go see you know the, the big game let's go to a game park but what about these coastlines or these other areas if you want to add on there's just are there small 
towns, I shouldn't say small, things that are accessible yet small that are great experiences for tourists mm-hmm. that might have lower infrastructure, such as a and b or hotel. Yeah, there are some great places like that in South Africa. There's this huge kind of network. It's not a network, but it's a very common thing. It's the kind of the B&B all over the place. You find them everywhere in South oh, okay. Africa. And you can do things like, uh, you know, farm stays, and people will rent out rooms in their homes, and there, there are some really great opportunities to travel along the coast. And the, um, uh, the garden route is a very popular uh, mm. route through the Eastern Cape I've in heard South about Africa. That. Are there, aren't there of, wineries down along that route? Or uh, I think the wineries are kind of more in the Western Cape. There are probably wineries there too, but um, South Africa is a big wine producing region. But the, the garden route is just this link up of a bunch of these very charming little coastal communities um, along the Eastern Cape. And you can stop and explore and get out. There's outdoors activities you can go hiking and all kinds of stuff it's it's a beautiful area wow that sounds pretty cool that sounds very cool the coast now of I kenya just wanna, now I just is quite gonna, different the coast um, of what the coast of kenya is very different um because from the you know basically from you know tanzania northwards along the coast uh, those areas have this really strong arab influence because the arabian traders uh, plied their wares up and down the east coast of Africa. So if you go to coastal cities like Dar es Salaam and Mombasa and Malindi and Kenya, like you don't feel like you're in Africa. The architecture is all Middle Eastern and all the women are in black um, wearing traditional Islamic dress and you hear the the call to prayer from the mosques and like you're in Africa but you feel like you're you're in Arabia. It's this amazing blend of cultures. So do you speak any of the African dialects, languages? Uh, I, I learned some when I lived there. Um, my Swahili I have definitely lost. Um, and uh, I've been trying to learn Zulu when, when I've been there, but uh, that's, uh, that's a challenging language to master. So- as a someone who would go and travel, say an American go to travel, should it's probably recommended that they join a tour or they do day tours or they you know hook up with a company in advance just to make sure they know what's going on and know where to go. I wouldn't say that's a prerequisite. Really, I mean, if, even if, for a first time visitor. If you're a first timer and you are nervous about the experience and maybe your 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 comfort level is medium or less then there are a lot of good options that will be a great introduction to the country. Um, and the, the level of professionalism of most of the tour operators there is just top class. Oh, fantastic. But if you are, if you want to kind of do your own thing and kind of experience the country through your, your own adventures and maybe not have it um, as scripted as a tour operator would offer, then it's totally fine to go on your own with a little homework and preparation. So speaking English, what would you do for someone who only spoke English to prepare? Is there like an app that you help on your phone or their words? I mean, how would, where do people just help you if you, if you smile? Oh, and people s- are enormously helpful. And in South Africa, the prevalence of English is really widespread. I mean, even this last November when I went back to the heart of Zululand to go raft the Tagela River again, um, you know, in the depths of Zululand and almost everybody spoke English. And, you know, the only person I met who didn't speak English was the woman running the store where I was trying to buy beer. And, you know, beer is the universal language, so I was still able to make it happen. Beer and money, universal. (laughs) And, and, you know, I went and met with um, uh, kind of the the second in command to the chief. And, you know, he spoke great English. The school system out there, you know, the, the South Africa places are really high priority on on education and the level of of education out there is is pretty good so okay that's good to know hey so wasn't that great if you weren't interested in africa before maybe you are now i I don't know the end result of my discussion with nick just left me re-energized about visiting africa and all of the cool things to do and i also just feel re-inspired to prioritize it and put it back up to the top of my list so i am going to be digging into my research again and checking out um, some cool tours and i will be sharing some of my research online at a midlifetraveler.com so 
if you're interested in Africa, go ahead and check it out too. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in to the Everywhere podcast and safe travels wherever you may roam.